I remember the day John approached me with this project. He needed 120 brass markers with intricate engraving and paint filled letters and logo. Now, I know what you're thinking. Brass is an easy material to cut. I'm pretty much a prototype guy, small batch guy. I've never really manufactured big batches with a CNC. I had to figure out a workflow, a strategy for cutting. This coin is all about the aesthetics. So let's make it look good. For the engraving, I started off with a pretty normal 60 degree V-bit and it was a little shallow for my taste. And when I did my first painting tests, I could tell that some of these numbers needed a little bit more depth. And if you go to the fusion file, you could tell that they were only 20 thou, I guess in diameter <laughs> on the uh, 2001, the one is only 20 thou thick. That meant I had to switch to a little bit different tool. For the paint testing, I really just didn't want to sit down at a table and individually fill letters with black before I would face the coin. And I tried lacquer, I tried epoxy, and I tried enamel, and a few different brands of each of those. So I have to first spray paint. The specific paint I used was Rust-Oleum High Performance Enamel. I really liked the finish that came out of it. It didn't bubble and it claimed to have a fast dry time, which wasn't really the case. I may have been spraying a little bit thick, but I came up with a way to get around that. My advice, if you want to cut anything paint in your machine, make sure the paint is 100% cured. I did have to spend about half a day cleaning the MX. Ah, <sighs> that was not fun. I needed to start figuring out the work holding for our raw stock. I came up with using two of our pallets and strips of stock measuring one and a half by 12 by 125. The first stop was going to be on the 24 hour router, mainly because its spindle speed of 24,000 will allow me to engrave at a much higher rate. Also with a much larger bed and a fixture plate to match, it was just easy using the pallets, taking them off, painting the pallets, putting them back on the machine, and then cutting out the outer contour. To attach the raw stock on the pallets for the 24 hour, I use the tried and true super glue tape technique. Personally, I don't use any kind of activator when I use super glue. One $7 roll of blue tape was plenty to do this whole project. It's really just the perfect way to hold parts like this for op one, especially because on the outer contour, I had to cut all the way through just to make sure I wasn't leaving any kind of burr or anything that would mess up my second op. The powder coat tape though does win out if you're using coolant or any type of lubrication just because the blue tape will soak that up and lose its adhesive. I probed the material in for the first time using a touch probe and I set each palette to have its individual work offset because it would let me change things in small amounts to help with consistency and it made programming simple and easy to keep track of. All right guys, so our material is glued up, it's probed in and now it's time to get to some actual machining. Our tool of choice is a 14 millimeter Datron two flute face mill. And these tools have a really nice edge radius that makes a really nice consistent face finish. And they're not really recommended for roughing, but I've used them quite a bit on the desktop machines, the smaller machines, and they've always worked really well. Not the cheapest tool, but they'll treat you right if you treat them right. This cut wasn't anything special. I just had to provide my next couple tools with a nice consistent flat surface so that they wouldn't be subjected to any kind of waves or any extra loading that they didn't need to take. My axial depth of cut was around 15 thou. My spindle speed, 10,000 RPM, and that is a SFM of 1442. It's a little low, but I had the time to just kind of let the machine work. And I ran a climb only cut because I wanted the chips to be directed to one corner of the machine so I could keep everything tidy. My feed per tooth was 2000, pretty good service finish, which it didn't really matter because I was going to super fly that later. For the next cut, I loaded up a Lakeshore Carbide 1 16th tooth flip. I needed to cut out the inner symbol on the coins, so I used a simple 2D contour operation and selected the inside and outside lines. I ran this tool at 24,000 RPM, which is the max spindle speed on the 24R. With small tools like this, it's a big benefit to be able to run at that high RPM. Keep in mind, with this small tool, that's not even 400 SFM. Next up was the engraving. Basically in my mind, the make or break part of this project. You know, what good is one of these pieces if you can't read what it says? I settled on a 40 degree single fluid engraver running at a max 24,000 RPM with an axial depth of cut of 5,000. Now I know that doesn't sound like much, but with V-carving, each additional pass puts more load on your cutter. Engraving was by far the most time intensive step of this process. With each part taking almost six minutes of engraving, one pallet takes about an hour and 20 minutes. 
I did like having that kind of cycle time because I could start on other projects and use other machines at the same time. Alright, so engraving looks great, the contouring looks great, and now it's time to apply the paint. I just masked the side of the material on the palette just because I didn't want to gunk it up and applied a few coats just to make sure I was filling up everything because when it did dry there was a little bit of shrinkage. After about a 24 hour cure time, the painted palettes were ready to be dropped on the diamond pins and bolted on to the 24 hours fixture plate for the outer contour that would cut them free from the strips of material. For this cut, I used a 1 8 4 flute and I wasn't very aggressive on it mainly because we were going to be cutting the material completely free and we were only going to be relying on the super glue and tape to hold them down. I ran 10,000 RPM, 40 inches per minute. Pretty simple cut. I didn't have any kind of vacuum or air blast and it ran fine. So that's the last leg of the trip for the 24R on these parts. From here, we removed them from the pallets, removed the tape, and then they went into the oven for curing. I found that around 175 degrees for about three to four hours was plenty of time and hot enough to reflow the paint and make it hard enough for the next step. Time for the 1100MX to really step up. We needed to face both sides of the parts and put a really nice fillet on the outer edge. I chose a dual station vise setup so I could run two soft jaws, technically three, and four parts at one time. To face the parts, we use the Tormach Superfly. This fly cutter tool has quickly become one of my favorite tools in the past few months because it's basically just a big single flute. The insert angle really helps balance the axial and radial forces as well. For the insert, we used a polished SEHT. Now, the RPM I ran it at was a little low, ran it at 2000. That's because I actually use a vibration app on my phone to see what the lowest vibration is. In certain RPM bands, you can see the vibration actually oscillate up and down. I really didn't want any kind of that vibration because there's a small chance that that could be transferred into the finish. So the smoothest running spindle should provide the smoothest finish. My feed per tooth was 3000, and this is about the minimum that I'll run this tool at uh, just because it needs a healthy bite to keep a good amount of load on it but uh, yeah you don't want to run this thing at like half a thou per tooth it's just not going to cut right it's not going to be happy the insert's not going to wear very well my depth of cut was 10 thou a decent depth of cut uh, like i said before because this brass doesn't like a, a very light skim cut and i also broke this tool path up into two parts because i wanted the tool to run right down the middle just so that I'd have the most consistent tool marks on the part. To really finish these parts off right, I chose to use a Lakeshore Carbide Corner Rounder. I felt that it would just give these parts that rounded, natural, you know, soft feel. For the cam on this, I chose to draw up a form tool and import it into the tool library. I then used a trace tool path and offset the tool with the axial offset and radial stock to leave to get that tool exactly where I wanted it. I then used the fusion simulation to confirm that it was going to make the cut that I needed. Alright, so now that we have the batch going all the way through to the workflow, John had asked me if we could also clear coat them. These parts didn't have anywhere to hang them from. So I came up with a really simple idea. A couple pieces of wood and a bunch of 70S2 welding wire just sharpened to a point and I was able to make little mini tripods for each part and it was easy to access the top and bottom at the same time to spray clear. Thankfully the clear went on nice and easy and dried very very fast compared to the enamel paint. This was kind of a tough project because I had to improvise on so many things there was a little variance here and there. I did find that in the oven at higher temperatures, you know, above 175, the brass did turn darker, so that might not fit with the aesthetic. I enjoyed using both the Tormach 24R and the Tormach 1100MX. Each one did what it was good at, you know, higher RPM for the router and low RPM big tools for the mill. A big shout out and thank you. Vince did such an awesome job on these ball markers and they were a huge hit uh, at the event. So here's the backstory. Uh, about a year ago, my wife, I got together with some of the local members of law enforcement and children's services and so forth to put together uh, what is called a CJCA, Children's Justice Center. It's an organization that helps provide services and a framework of things for kids, uh, mostly kids who are the victims of sexual or physical abuse. 
Um, ours is called Heroes Landing. It's been a huge success so far. They've gotten a space and it helps kids not have to go out of the area to get these services when these things unfortunately do uh, happen. And they put together this first charity event and I thought, hey, this is something as a machinist that I can do to help contribute. And they were a huge hit. Side note, if you're watching this and you're starting a manufacturing company or trying to get your name out there, uh, these were a huge hit. We paid it forward and we had a lot of people ask about what we do. Uh, so keep that in mind is a really good way. It reminds me back in the New York City days. Some of the first things I did were uh, found local artists who wanted stuff made. And I was like, hey, let me figure out how to make it. So anyways, folks, as always, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.